Hello, my name is Jenny and I'm a member of Woodville Baptist Church and I'll be sharing today on the verses from 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 to 10. But before I do that, let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for this time that we have together now and I pray that our hearts and ears would be open to hearing what you have to say to us. I pray that we would be ready to listen and live by your truth. In Jesus' name. What I'm about to share today follows on from what Pastor Josh shared last week. If you haven't listened to his sermon, I do encourage you to do so. He shared on 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 1 to 3, and I'll recap those briefly. They warn us of the reality that there are false prophets and false teachers within God's church and among God's people. Peter warns that they will secretly introduce false teachings and that many will be duped and follow them. Verse 3 points towards their judgment, that God sees it and he will deal with it. Verse 3 says their condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping. So from verse 4 onwards, we discover more about this. So I'm going to read those verses now. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment... If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless. For that righteous man, living among them day after day, was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, they are not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. So that's quite heavy and I'll do my best to unpack it. These verses outline how God is going to respond to these false teachers, but it also tells us how he will judge sin in general. It matters to him that his people are being led astray and that his divine truth is being distorted. These false teachers even questioned whether the second coming of Jesus to judge the world would ever happen. And we'll learn more about that later on in chapter three. In distorting the truth of who God is through their teaching, they are sinning. And if they are unrepentant of that, God cannot abide it. He cannot deny himself and be lenient to sin. He is merciful, good and gracious and loving, but he is also holy, just, righteous and a judge. He does not bend his character to a particular people group or situation. So false teaching will incur judgment. So how does Peter illustrate this? Well, he takes us back through history to Genesis and shows us how God dealt with depraved conduct through three examples that follow after each other in the book of Genesis. The first example is of the angelic beings being judged for their sin and sent to hell to be put in chains and await their final judgment. If he didn't spare the angels, then he won't spare the false teachers. Whilst this is Peter's first example, it's also the first example in Genesis chapter six where God starts disciplining the angelic. He judges them just as he judges humans on earth. He is the same God when he is interacting with heavenly beings as when he is interacting with earthly beings. He does not bend. There are different thoughts on how these angels sinned. Some think it refers to Genesis chapter six, verses one to nine, where the angels, the sons of God took human wives. Some think that it refers to demons who possessed men who then took wives. And some think it refers to Satan's fall when he was cast out of heaven and into hell because he tried to become greater than God. And we can read about that in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 15. Whatever they did, it was in unrepentant rebellion to God and they were sent to hell. The word for hell here is Tartarus, also used in Jude chapter six, which is a temporary place of torment and torture for angels. It's not a place that humans go, but where angels are reserved for the final day of judgment on Christ's return. Whilst the judgment might be delayed, it is certain. 
So verse 5 goes on to a different example. Verse 5 says, For if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people. And this takes us onto the story of Noah, which follows the story of the angels in Genesis 6. God did not spare the ancient pre-flood world, but judged them for their wickedness, their corruption, perversion and violence by sending a worldwide catastrophic flood of such magnitude that he vowed never to do it again. And he gave us the rainbow as a sign of this promise. The flood is referred to in the Bible as a warning that a greater judgment is coming. And when, when Jesus comes for the final time to judge the world, and that will have eternal consequences. Jesus refers to the flood in Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 to 39, when he warns that just as the world did not know exactly when the flood was going to come, neither do we know exactly when Jesus is going to come again. So we need to be prepared for his return, repent of our sins and follow him. Then verse 6 goes on to refer to two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, whose practices were detestable to God and distorted God's standard for sex. Verse 6 says, For he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. These cities were burned to ashes. They were totally destroyed. Jesus also refers to Sodom in Luke chapter 17 verses 29 to 32 and uses the fate of Sodom to warn about the final judgment on the world when he returns. And yet, God shows mercy to those who repent of their sins and trust in him. He rescued Noah and seven others in the ark. Verse 5 describes Noah as a preacher of righteousness and Genesis 6, 9 describes Noah as blameless, righteous and faithfully walking with God. His community must have thought he was bonkers spending decades building an ark on dry ground in preparation for a flood that no one knew when it would come. And yet he remained faithful to what God asked him to do and he was not deterred. The way he lived his life preached or demonstrated his righteousness. God saw that and spared him. And I love how he told him that before he sent the flood so that he would know that he was going to live. With Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham pleaded with God to spare the cities if 10 righteous men could be found there. God conceded but could not find 10 righteous men. He found one, Lot. And so he saved Lot but destroyed the cities. Lot was living in amongst the depravity but was considered righteous in the eyes of God as he was tormented by what he saw and heard happening around him. Because of Abraham's request, God sent two angels to Sodom to save Lot. The men in the city surrounded Lot's house and wanted to abuse the visitors, but Lot protested, would not let them, but offered his daughters instead, which isn't an honourable thing to do either. So there was some weakness in Lot's courage, but God was gracious and saw him as righteous. The messengers actually rescued Lot and his family from the clutches of the wicked men. So God knows how to rescue the godly and how to judge the ungodly. We don't need to be perfect, however, to be godly. We will make mistakes and we will sin, but Jesus has washed us clean as he paid the price for all our sins so that we can be blameless in the eyes of God. But we are to surrender our lives to Jesus and follow his ways above our own. In verse 10, Peter calls out the apostates, the false teachers of his day and he describes their characteristics. He describes them as those who willfully follow the desires of the flesh, a disposition to rebel against God, to despise his authority. And this suggests to me that they are unteachable and not open to repentance. They are marked by stubbornness, irreverence and arrogance. And of course we can all be a little bit bold and stubborn and arrogant from time to time, but um, if we remain humble and we acknowledge that before God and we ask him to change our hearts, then he will do that and he will be gracious towards us. So the message to the church is important. We need to pursue a deepening relationship with God. We need to know our scriptures and remain true to them. We need to be aware that there are false teachers within the wider body of Christ and that there will be to come. We need to recognize them 
and be prepared to stand against them by speaking up like Lot and standing firm like Noah. We need to be teachable and repent of our sins and we do not need to be afraid for God will rescue those who are blameless in his eyes. So whilst this message is about the judgment of false teachers, it shows us just how much God hates sin and that has to be atoned for. And that is relevant to all of us. God did not spare fallen angels. He did not spare the wicked ancient world or depraved cities. He will judge all who have sinned against him. However, neither did he spare his precious son. He gave him as a holy sacrifice to pay for the price of our sins, a price that we deserve to pay, but can never pay so that we could be forgiven and be rescued from such judgment and spend eternity in God's presence. This is his desire for mankind. We were created to be in relationship with him. He does not want us to perish, but sin has a price and the only one who can save us from the consequence of sin, which is death, and eternity away from God is Jesus. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. So take heart, church. Stand firm in your faith. Stay close to Jesus as we live in a world that does not think that judgment is coming, just as in the ancient world they did not think the flood was coming. But we are not to hide away and wait until he returns. We're to go out into the world and share the beauty of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, our undeserved pardon, to share the blessings that we have in God and to bring the kingdom of heaven near to earth. We are to show people that Jesus died for everyone because his heart's desire is that no one will perish. And if you'd like to get in contact with us to talk about anything I've said today or to find out more about Jesus and what he has done for you, then please get in touch through the details on our website. Thank you for listening.